we live in uh, we live in a different time. When you think of um, when we think of a year ago, um, our vocabulary has changed just in in ten months. The, uh, the word pandemic, we didn't think about that uh, 10 months ago. The concept of social distancing, we didn't think of that uh, 10 months ago. Uh, we hear the word lockdown quite a bit, don't we? We uh, hear the word uh, quarantine quite a lot. We hear the, we, you go to the store and you see a sign that says, don't enter without a mask. Um, completely different change of vocabulary just in number of months. And um, I, I I just appreciate this verse because um, none of our lives runs in a straight line. N none of our lives are like that. There, there's ups, there's downs, there's uh, there's um, there's joys, there's there's sorrows, there's pits, there's valleys, there's hills, um, there's times of uh, of sorrow, there, there's times of of uh, of, uh, of of joy. Um, our lives are not like a straight line. And I think we can all understand uh, the concept of that. And yet, um, as we've read in this verse, uh, God is very, very interested in all the, the minute do details of our life. Um, I, I've, I've just been so encouraged to, um, to see the Lord's hand in, in little details. And you know, the, the word is, is full of them. What, what I want to do um, for the next little bit is I want to look at a few thoughts from the book of Joshua, just the earlier chapters, some of the exercises that Joshua went through. That's where I've been going um, in my personal reading. It's been a real encouragement to me um, to, um, to go through that book. But as I've been considering uh, this verse in Proverbs, I, I've thought of the... Um, the people that we have in the word where the Lord manifested himself to them in a very, very marked way in the unremarkable, everyday, routine things of life. We, we, we have a tendency to look at the big events, uh, but they're usually coupled with, with uh, just the minute details of just, just for for an example, think of David uh, being asked to um, to take some bread and cheese to his brothers and to the captain of their host. You know, so off he goes. Um, he's basically delivering a lunch, and we think, well, you know, how 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 remarkable is that? And yet, what's the end of the story? Goliath's head comes off, and that's just one of the details. Uh, um, of his life, one of the everyday detail of his life. Think of, of, of Daniel and think of him praying as it says, he prayed in three times a day and he opened his window and he prayed just like he did every other day. And coupled with that, we have him thrown in the lion's den. We have the lions that have their mouths shut and he's pulled out, coupled with just something that was an everyday detail of his life. Think of the lad in the, in the gospels that Either he made a lunch or his mother made him a lunch and off he went. He had no idea that there was going to be 5,000 people fed. I think we, we, we don't put importance on the everyday details of our life that the Lord puts very much importance on. And if we can, if we can focus on those little details and, and seek to to carry out our responsibilities, our everyday responsibilities um, with the Lord, uh, there's marvelous things happen. And that doesn't mean that every time David took a lunch somewhere that uh, a giant's head came off. But the Lord used that. He, 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 he used that experience at a time when David was just obedient to carrying out the responsibilities that were his. And uh, you know how good it is for us to simply do that. Get up in the morning and, and just to carry out our responsibilities, a marvelous thing to see the Lord's hand in those things. Well, let's, let's look now at this, um, 
this man, Joshua. Um, we turn to the book of Joshua. And we'll just, I'm just going to think out loud as we go through um, a few instances in the first, uh, in the early chapters of, um, of this book. So the first chapter of Joshua, uh, of course, everyone's familiar. We're not going to speak as if this is an unfamiliar book or that the previous books are unfamiliar. But there's been a passing of the torch from Moses to, um, to Joshua. And we have, a, we have a statement here in the first chapter. It's in the sixth verse. It says, um, be strong and of a good courage. Now notice the seventh verse. We see the same statement. Only be thou strong, very courageous. Look at the ninth verse. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. You know, that would suggest to me that um, Joshua perhaps felt somewhat weak. He perhaps felt that uh, he lacked courage. And so there's this exhortation. If you, we go on in that ninth verse, it says, uh, be not afraid. You know, that would really suggest that perhaps he was a little fearful of that which was before him. It goes on to say, uh, neither be thou dismayed. You know, that perhaps um, suggests that that which Joshua was facing, um, it, it looked perhaps a little bit overwhelming. And I, I think we can identify with those statements in our own lives. At least I can. Maybe I'm unique. Maybe I'm the only one that's ever been a little bit fearful. Maybe I'm the only one that's felt a little bit weak. Maybe I'm the only one here that's uh, felt overwhelmed. Um, I don't think so, though. I've, I've had others, one or two others anyway, that have stated the same thing. Um, and I think these are normal things for us. But to hear, to, to see a man like Joshua characterized by things, I think is a tremendous encouragement uh, to, uh, to my own heart. And to see that which Joshua was facing, um, that which was before him. And uh, it's interesting that if we look at these verses, they're coupled. This, this ninth verse, be strong, be of good courage, be not afraid, be not dismayed. It's coupled with what we have in the eighth verse. And that is, the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for thou shalt make thy way very prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. You know, I've, I've just been so encouraged how so often we, we have encouragement connected with the reading and the meditating of the Word of God. I had an interesting thing happen. I, I've told this story um, uh, before, but it was, it was something that really exemplified the Word of God to me. And that was some time ago, uh, I came out of a bank, and there was a man outside the bank there, and uh, he was dressed, dressed very shabbily, and uh, he asked if I had any spare change because he was hungry. Well, um, I live in a rural area, and the, the closest town is the town of Smith Falls. It's a very small town, and we don't generally see street people in that town. But here was, here was a, street, uh, a street person, and uh, you know, you can't fix everything in this world. You can't, uh, you can't stop at every single person that asks for something like that. Um, so I kept walking. And I got up to my truck, and it, I just felt as if the Lord was saying, you know, um, maybe you should deal with this one. So I kind of took a deep breath, you know. Ah, okay. And um, um, he started to walk up the street to where I was at the truck. When he got to the truck, I said, hey, uh, how about we go for something to eat? He said, oh, that would be great. I said, well, hop in. So he hops in the truck, and... We headed over to, um, 
to a restaurant, fast food place. And on the way over, I said to him, um, you know, you've got a story and I've got a story. Uh, how about we share each other's stories? And I said, in fact, um, give it some thought while we're getting our sandwiches and you can decide who goes first. So he said, okay. So we, we ordered our sandwiches and we went and sat down at the table and he looks at me and he says, uh, I'll go first. So I said, well, that, that's fine. Um, he says, you're going to think I'm really, really strange. You're going to think I'm really weird. I said, um, I, I don't know, just um, you go ahead. He said, no, you're going to think I'm really strange. I said, well, look, try me. So he says, well, um, I'm what they call a Christian. And if you don't know what that, what that is, that is someone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Well, you know, my jaw dropped down. I wasn't expecting this. Here, here's this guy. He's obviously got addictions. Uh, he's, in, he's in very bad disrepair. And he tells me he's a believer. I thought, well, I'm just going to let him go. I'm going to see, what, see, what, see where this goes. So he tells me, he said, you know, my, um, I never knew my parents. Um, they, um, when, I, when I was born, I went from foster home to foster home to foster home. And every home I went into, I was taken into, was a, a Christian home where the Bible was read. And, um, and he said, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. You know, I, I'm listening to this. He's got no idea that I'm a believer. I, I'm sitting there, I'm listening, and I'm thinking, I wonder where this is going. And he says, um, I, um, the, the man was 52. He said, I got married and had four children. And I, I got in with a bad crowd at work and I started to drink and I immediately became an alcoholic. And he said that led to other addictions. And the result of it was I lost my job. I, I lost my house. I lost my wife. I lost my family. I lost everything and became a hopeless street person with nothing. But he said, a few weeks ago, God put it on my heart to read my Bible. And he says, it's alive. It's the only thing I have that's alive. And it's marvelous. And he, at that point, he started to give me a simple gospel as to what I need. You know, this is interesting. It's, it's my dollar. I'm sitting there listening. I'm not, I, I'm prepared actually to give him the gospel. And now here I'm finding he's a believer and he, and he's giving me the gospel. And he, he just shared with me how that he's been struggling. Uh, at that point, I kicked in and showed, uh, told him that I was a believer and we shared some things. And he said, you know, I, I've, I've just been struggling with addictions and someone has taken me other, under their wing and has started to have a little Bible study with me. And I, I, I've been encouraged to, to realize that God is giving me another chance. And I just thought, you know, how marvelous it is that here's a man, he's lost everything, and God puts it in his heart to read his Bible again. I thought, wow. And it, it, it's marvelous, you know, that what we've read here, when the Lord speaks to Joshua, it's connected with a reading and a meditating of the Word of God. Well, May we be encouraged to do just what Joshua did here and each one of us have that in our lives. That not just a few verses in the morning, not just a few verses at night, but whatever, whatever it is we read, to be able to chew on it through the day, that we would get the good out of it and that we would realize just like this man. You might pray for this man. His name is Gary Horn. And uh, the Lord is working with him. And yet here he had the courage to, even when he's in a bad state, to share the gospel with someone he thought was a complete stranger and didn't know Christ. Well, let's look further on in this chapter in the book of Joshua. There's a little statement that we have here, because they're about to go over the uh, Jordan. They're about to, um, Joshua's about to send the spies. We have a little statement here 
in the 12th verse, 12, 13, and 14 with, in connection with the, uh, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And we have uh, the exhortation for them to, to help their brethren. It's just that little statement that we have in the 14th verse. It says, well, let's read those three verses. Uh, Joshua 1, verse 12, 13, and 14. And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. I was just encouraged with that little statement, and help them. And what a, what a beautiful thing if um, we had an exercise to get up in the morning and through our, our everyday um, uh, responsibilities to, to have a focus that today I'm going to try to help somebody. I'm so thankful for those in a day's time that are help to me. They might even just draw alongside and say, you know, I remembered to pray for you this morning. Uh, what a boost that is. Well, the Lord has given us the capacity, just like these ones. They were to go over there to help their brethren. And uh, the, the concept of helping a whole pile of people can be, can be daunting, but just to be able to help someone. Uh, I'm so thankful for those that have just reached out in a day's time and just sought to be a help to me. Well, let's go on now um, to the third chapter. This second chapter, you know, it's a beautiful chapter. The, the chapter of Rahab, you know, she's, um, she's uh, an example of uh, some of the sisters that are perhaps um, um, the best evangelists that we have. When you think of the woman at the well and what an evangelist she was. Uh, you think of, of Rahab, because when you go to uh, later on in the book of Joshua, when Joshua sends the spies to her home, you read there, if you read the marginal reading, her house was full. Her house was full. It says, and she brought out all the families. I, I've just pictured her house packed with people because of her testimony. And we read, of course, in Hebrews that, uh, that she was... Um, she was spared. She, it says there that she perished not um, with them that believed not. Uh, what a beautiful story it, it is uh, to go through the, the, the story of Rahab, but we don't, it's not my purpose to do that. Uh, but let's go to the third chapter now. And I just want to look at some verses in this third chapter. Um, because what happens in, in the third chapter is we have, they, they cross the Jordan. Um, let's read a few verses here. Uh, Joshua chapter three. Uh, we'll read, um, we'll read 14, 15 and 16. It says, it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan. And the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the Jordan. For the Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap, very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan. And those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. Just in meditating on this crossing of the Jordan, it was, and I, I understand, um, you know, the, the picture that it is, the, the Red Sea and the Jordan, um, the the Lord's going into death, us going into death and being raised with the Lord Jesus. It's not that line of things that I want to take up. But just to consider that the passing of the Jordan was very different than the crossing of the Red Sea. If we're to turn to Exodus, we won't. 
but uh, to look there in chapter 14, chapter 13, 14, with the, the, uh, the Egyptians uh, pursuing the children of Israel, they come to the Red Sea, and, you know, the Egyptians aren't very far behind. The Red Sea's in front of them. You got mountains on both sides. And what happens? Moses takes his rod, as he's told. He puts it over the Red Sea. The Red Sea opens up, and they go through. You know, and many of us can look back to experiences just like that in our own life where the Lord, Lord has miraculously opened up a hopeless situation. Uh, we sometimes sing a little hymn, His love in times past forbids us to think He'll leave us at last in trouble to sink. And I think many of us can look back in our lives to times when the Lord came in in such a special way that seemed absolutely hopeless. But the Jordan was different. The Jordan at this time, it said it was overflowing its banks. And it did that all the time of harvest. And we have that, we have that expression uh, numerous times in the word, where the, the Jordan was a raging torrent. And I think that that's, that's uh, what's remarkable in the book of Ruth, with, with Ruth coming with Naomi and, um, and Orpah, standing perhaps there at the Jordan. Because it says there that they, they entered into the land at the beginning of barley harvest. So we know that at that time, the Jordan was a raging torrent. And it perhaps was daunting. Maybe one of the things that even caused Orpah to turn back is looking at the Jordan and thinking, oh, how are we going to get across that? So you have that numerous times in the word. And so here they are. They're, they're approaching the Jordan. As I said, it's a raging torrent. And, and what do they do? Well, it's different than the Red Sea. The Red Sea, Moses put his arm over the Red Sea, it opened up and they went through. But not so here. Here they were to walk right into it. You know, and so, sometimes there are those scenarios in our life where the Lord doesn't open up something in advance like he does at the Red Sea. And sometimes we just got to go forward. And we think, I think of how daunting that would have been to, to look at the Jordan just raging and they had to keep walking. And it wasn't until they got their foot into it that it opened up. And, and, and many times in our own lives, we have that very experience. But if you go back in our chapter now, what gave them, I think, courage to do this, there was an exhortation that was given to them. Um, if we look at the fourth verse, of the third chapter, chapter 3 and, and verse 4. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, this is the ark, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Uh, come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify yourselves. Oh, there's the necessity for us to have personal purity in our own lives in order for us to be able to have the courage to step into a Jordan. For us to be able to, to, to have the courage to go ahead with what the Lord would have us to do. Sometimes there's those, as I spoke about those uh, menial everyday things of life. Sometimes we don't think they're of any worth, and so we don't accomplish them. We don't do them. But oh, that we would keep our vessels pure, our personal vessels pure, that we might be able to have the courage to go ahead, just like Joshua and the people did. And what happens is they, they stepped into the Jordan, and the Jordan, the Jordan opened up, and there was a marvelous victory, wasn't there? Um, with them going through on dry land. Uh, the Red Sea was marvelous too. But the Jordan is different that way in that um, it didn't open up beforehand. And I think that many of us can, can relate to that kind of a scenario in our own lives where we, we have to go for it. You know, there's a verse in, um, there's a verse in, um, in Jeremiah uh, because the, 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 the Jordan overflowing its banks is numerous times in the word. But there, there's one in Jeremiah, if you turn to that for a moment. 
uh, the book of Jeremiah, the, the 12th chapter, there's a question that's asked there. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 12. So there's this discourse, and uh, we have in the fifth verse, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if the land of peace wherein thou trustest, they weary thee, it's this statement, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? What do we do when we come to a Jordan and it's swollen? You know, if we haven't been characterized by sanctification, if we haven't been characterized by personal purity, it completely takes away our moral courage to be able to carry on and go forward when what lies ahead looks so daunting. And so may we be encouraged just to do that. You know, the enemy wants to keep us distracted. There, there's so many distractions. And if he can do that, uh, it takes away from our moral courage to be able to go ahead forward when what's ahead looks uh, so difficult and looks absolutely impossible. Well, let's go on now to, um, to the fifth chapter. The fifth chapter is, um, is, uh, is just prior to, um, to, to Jericho being, uh, being taken. Uh, I think that would have been a daunting thing for the children of Israel to look ahead and to see, um, to see Jericho with its walls. And, um, you know, even before they, they crossed the Jordan to look ahead and think, uh, you know, how is this going to happen? And you think of the, um, perhaps the young men thinking, you know, how are we going to get over these walls? Are we going to scale, you're going to take, uh, the courses and how to scale these walls. And, uh, you know, the Lord has, has all the details in, in, in perfect order, and they just have to go through with the details that the Lord gives them to do. And in accomplishing those, there is tremendous victory. But Joshua here is perhaps contemplating, and I just like to read the 12th verse to the 15th verse of uh, Joshua chapter 5. So here in the 12th verse, it says, The manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Now that suggests that they had the manna and they had the old corn both in one day, just for one day. Um, and maybe somebody has a thought on that. That's an interesting, uh, interesting detail. There was one day where they had manna and old corn. It says, Neither had the children of Israel a manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy foot from off thy foot. For the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. I really enjoyed this, um, this portion, you know, with, um, with Joshua going for a stroll. And the first thing we find here is they lifted up his eyes. You know, that's a, that's a really good posture for us, isn't it? Is to keep our eyes lifted above this scene. It's so easy to be taken up with the distractions around us. It's so easy to be to be taken up with with what our neighbors are are going through with con, with regards to the ban, pandemic that we find ourselves in. It's it's so easy to to be taken up with the political unrest. There there are so many things to distract. But what a blessing for Joshua here. Why? Because he had his eyes lifted up. 
It said he lifted up his eyes and looked. You think of um, the people of God going through the, through the wilderness, and they, they, had to, they had to have their, their eyes lifted above it in order to see the pillar of fire move, in order to see the pillar of cloud move. And in order for us to get direction on a daily basis in the everyday things of life, just the little everyday things of life, our, our gaze has to be upward. It has to be upward. And that, you know, the enemy is, is going to work overtime to get our, day, our gaze looking down. Oh, that we might be encouraged to continually have our, our, our gaze lifted above, just like we have Joshua. Here's the king to pass. As he's by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes. Well, we find there's a man that stands over here. And uh, Joshua asks, um, asks a question. Uh, art thou for us or for our adversaries? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting answer that's given to that question. Because that question is not answered directly. The question here is, are you for us or, or for our adversaries? And we have this expression now, as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? It's not captain of the host of Israel. It's captain of the host of the Lord. And, you know, I dare say that we're surrounded by that, but we can't see. Remember Elisha asking uh, the Lord to open the young man's eyes. Think of what he saw. We had a, we, we had a, I'm a little low on sleep. Um, two nights ago, uh, a few of us um, sat around the bed of a dear sister here, 78 years old. And uh, we sat all night with her and um, she took her last breaths at quarter to five in the morning. Um, she's been sick for, for the last few months, uh, dear sister. Um, it's kind of been exercising for us. The Lord has taken um, six older brethren from us in this assembly in the last um, eight months. Uh, four brothers in their 80s and 90s. This sister and her uh, this sister was 78. But as as we sat there, um, sister communicated with us earlier in the day, and um, and then she she lost consciousness. Her breathing went slower and slower, and that moment came. And I'm sure some of you have been present with, with someone as they took their last breath. I've been um, at quite a number of, of, uh, of different ones, uh, sat by their bed, held their hand or whatever as, the, as, uh, as they took their last breath. And I, I just wondered, you know, how does the, we know we're spirit, soul, and body, uh, we know that our body is our is our physical shell. We have our spirit and our soul. Um, there's that God consciousness uh, with us, and then there's also that um, there's there's our person. There's it's our character um, that is perhaps our soul. You know it says about um, about um, um, in Genesis that God breathed into man's nostrils and he became a living soul. It's, it, it's the person. When, um, when those that went into the ark are numbered, it says, and there went in eight souls. But I, I was just thinking there, it was just a quiet scene as this dear sister took her last breath and then she was just peaceful. She just relaxed. And I thought, you know, how, how does the spirit get from here to the glory? What's the process there? We're going to have to wait to have a lot of those questions answered. But it was just holy ground to, to see here a sister. Now, I spoke with her a week before. And I said to her, I said, you know, I'm a little envious of you. And she says, why is that? I said, well, you know, you're going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. She gave me this great big smile. She says, I know. And I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's beautiful to see, to be at the bedside, the, the death bed scene of someone that, that's a believer that's just longing to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. I just love that. And yet we know that there, there, there is that um, 
you know, we didn't see anybody in the room. The Lord was there, very much there. We have precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Um, that's very, very different than um, the Lord um, having no enjoyment with the death of the wicked. What a contrast, isn't it? And I, you know, I thought um, when it says um, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, I think, you know, what's precious about that? I remember being in, um, in, um, in a home where there was a whole number of brothers. We were all sitting around and we were, um, I was a younger brother at the time, and we were discussing the Lord's coming. And there was various and, various and different uh, sundry remarks made about the Lord's coming. And there was one brother that was very quiet. And uh, at the end of it, he said, um, you know, I'm looking for the Lord's uh, coming too. But what I'd really like is to go through the article of death, like my blessed Lord. I thought, wow, that was a, a noble desire to have. And the Lord granted him that desire. And he was taken home to be with the Lord sometime later. But I wondered if that's part of the preciousness in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, it was a beautiful time, but it reminded me of the host of the Lord that we have in this scene. You know, we have, we have touches of it. In Ephesians 6, we know that there's a warfare going on. But what, what a marvelous thing to, to, to recognize that uh, this statement here is not the host of Israel. The, the Lord's host is mentioned many times. I think the first person that uses the, the expression, the Lord of hosts, is, um, I believe it's Hannah. It's Hannah, she's praying. I'm not sure if it's the first, her prayer is in the second chapter, but it's perhaps in the first chapter, she makes mention to the Lord of hosts. Well, here, Joshua He's, he's stepping forward here, and he's, he's pretty concerned as to what's going to transpire. And the Lord uh, makes it very clear that he's got everything in full control, and it's the Lord that's going to win the battle. And as you go through the succeeding um, chapters, uh, we know it's the Lord that, um, that of course, uh, continually wins the battle. Well, here we find... Um, that Joshua says, um, what saith my Lord unto his servant? You know, I, I really appreciated um, um, uh, Doug mentioning, Doug Jacobson mentioning um, there a couple of meetings back when, um, when Elijah was, was, was fleeing from Jezebel. And he gets to that point where he leaves his servant behind and he goes forward without his servant and uh, appreciated Doug you mentioning how he, he left that servant character behind for a period of time there. Well, here Joshua had that, that servant character, didn't he? And he says, what saith my Lord unto his servant? Beautiful deportment, beautiful posture for every one of us to have. And, the, and we have here, it says, the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy foot from off thy foot. You know, I, I think that in, in my own life, there's a lack of recognizing that I'm in the presence of the Lord all the time. And if, if I would be conscious of that all the time, I would be conscious of what Joshua did here in, says he loosed his shoe from off his foot, for the place whereon he stood was holy ground. And I think that if we had a, a conscious recognition of the Lord there with us all the time, it, it would really affect my deportment. It, it, would, it, would affect, it, would, it would affect every part of my life. And it would affect how I do the menial, everyday things of life. Like David taking sandwiches to his brother. And wow, what a marvelous end. Well, may we be encouraged, every one of us, to, to consider here that Joshua was deportment, and, and Joshua's thoughts, and if we go through the succeeding chapters, uh, it, it really um, reminds me of what we have in that, that verse that we started with in the, in the book of Proverbs, where a man's heart deviseth his way. 
but the Lord directed his steps. We, we have a responsibility to go forward. And as I said, none of our lives are a straight line. None of them are. There's lots of twists. There's lots of turns. But that's okay. Just to walk in a manner that's a manner of submission to whatever the Lord brings across our pathway is a tremendous, peaceful way to live. And may we be encouraged to do that. Well, I'm sure that there's, there's many that would have uh, some comments with regards to this. So maybe I'll just commend us to the Lord. And then um, I, would, uh, I would be most happy to hear uh, others' thoughts on some of these portions. Let's just ask the Lord for um, blessing.